Morning Call. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. Welcome to the CNBC TV18 Motilal Oswal Studio. I'm Sonia and joining me is Surbi and Nigel. It's a brand new day of trade and uh, today is actually Holi. So happy Holi to all who are celebrating across the country. Uh, we had the day off yesterday, so we got a chance to celebrate. But folks, uh, happy Women's Day, happy Holi. There's so much to celebrate today. Well, happy Women's Day to you all and happy Women's yeah. Day to all our, uh, you know, lady audience as well. I'm glad that I'm lucky that I'm surrounded by, you know, uh, very strong women, both uh, in my personal as well as in my professional life. And I'll see both of you all manage, you know, homes, manage personal lives as well as your professional life. So more power to you all. Well, let me give some compliments back. I don't think uh, we women could have done it without the support of men like you in the office and at home. So I think it's partnership. That's what counts. And uh, yes, uh, we are starting on a very buoyant note. We haven't, if you'd noticed, spoken about the market just as yet yeah. because we're letting the, the celebrations roll. Don't want to spoil the party. Uh, yes, a very, very happy holy to a lot of people in the north and other parts of the country that are celebrating the festival today. And it's a great time, a great era to live in, right? And we're having a lot of discussions about Women's Day, not just about uh, issues like the gender pay gap, gender equality, the challenges that women go through. Just having these discussions is... Uh, is, I think, uh, the start to all the problems getting solved eventually. But, uh, well, we'll have, uh, you know, this chat through the course of the day. For now, let's get back to the markets because uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be a pretty start. The adjusted SGX Nifty is indicating that there could be a 50-point gap down opening this morning. And that's largely because of, you know, what we've uh, been talking about in the last one hour, which is the hawkish Fed. And uh, perhaps the fact that there will be more rate hikes, there will be more aggressive rate hikes in order to, uh, to tame inflation. Now, this is what uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell uh, said in his statement. He said the latest economic data has come in stronger than what was expected, which suggests that the ultimate level of interest rates is likely to be higher than what was previously anticipated. And that's what got the ball rolling in terms of the sell-off across the globe. The Dow had a steep sli a slide, almost uh, 600 points gone overnight. It's now, in fact, turned negative for 2023. And the next meeting, the FOMC meeting, is on the 21st and 22nd of March. So the expectation is that it's going to be a rate hike, of course, but larger than the 25 basis points rate hike we saw in the previous policy. And uh, that set off, uh, sell off, ju not just in equities, but in commodities as well. Crude has seen a sharp slide. We'll talk about that in greater detail. Banks were under pressure, U.S. banks. So, uh, you know, you had the likes of Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, all down about 3 to 5%. Uh, the next thing to watch will be the jobs report on Friday. It could show a resilient market that may perhaps allow the Fed to keep hiking. Uh, so that's the other thing to watch out for. So the global setup is not looking good at all. As we kickstart the day, the SGX Nifty is down about 50 odd points. But the good part is both foreign and domestic investors bought in the cash market. So FI has bought, what, about 720 crores. DI has bought about 750 crores. Uh, on uh, Monday, we actually conquered that 20-day moving average of 17,700 thereabouts. So let's see what happens with the gap down opening. Does it get bought into? Uh, you know, does the sell-off continue? Time will tell. But for now, the start at least will be in the red. And, you know, I mean, there's going to be a bit of this uh, cautious, tentative view up until the Fed policy. Uh, because the expectation now, as we know, is that, you know, the Fed is going to keep the rates higher for longer, but even the rate hike is perhaps going to be much more than what was anticipated. Yeah, I think, uh, Sonia, this was a slam dunk that even the biggest bears wouldn't, you know, they probably didn't see it, see it coming. Everyone was talking about this Friday jobs report. Mm. You know, we were all saying that that's going to be the real litmus test for this uh, recovery rally that started. But uh, Fed Chair Powell's comments, I mean, I just want to add one more uh, quote to the one that you also laid out, and that really got the market rattled. He goes on to say, uh, and I'm quoting uh, Jerome Powell in, from the prepared text, uh, if the totality of data were to indicate that faster tightening is warranted, we would be prepared to increase the pace of rate hikes. It's a very direct comment and uh, probably one that was designed to really tame the market's expectation that the Fed is anywhere close to being done. I mean, he's gone, in, you know, gone on record in very explicit language. And these are prepared remarks. Uh, and that is what the market perhaps did not see coming. Though, of course, we were always talking about the U.S. 10-year yield around 4% and, you know, how much higher the rates will go. He simply confirmed the market's worst fears. The interesting uh, action actually happened in the two-year. Uh, not so much the 10-year, though the 10-year is now back around the 4% uh, handle as well. It's the two-year yield 
that top the 5% <clears throat> mark. So the two-year at 5%. The tenure at 4%, the differential is 100 basis points. And that's uh, that's quite quite high over the last couple of uh, years. And we keep talking about this inverted yield curve in the US. It is inverted. It's getting a little steeper. And typically in the past, you know, this inverted yield curve is the, you know, is the warning sign of a recession. That debate still very much alive and kicking. Other asset classes, gold shaved off. You had about three, three odd dollars gone from crude. Though, you know, the crude markets are... Okay, right. as of now, there's some stability out there on uh, on both Brent and on NYMEX. But markets across the board were rattled while we here in Mumbai were, of course, busy celebrating Holi. So the question is, what happens now? I'm just going back to watching the February lows. Now, for the Nifty, the February low was 17,255. Uh, it is still, uh, you know, a good 200 points from, from where we are. So let's see how the market negotiates that. The bank Nifty low was actually not the same day when the Nifty hit its low. The bank Nifty low was on the, on the budget day. Uh, and that's a level in question. Again, we're, you know, distance from these levels. But we need to see whether uh, the shakedown takes out these levels uh, on the way down or whether buyers emerge. The one good aspect that's happened, again, the news flow around the Adani group of companies continues to be positive. So after the money coming in, a part of that money, about half of that money has been used by the promoters to pare down their pledges. So at least on the Adani front, Nigel, the news flow is positive. But globally, we have enough to, I think, talk about uh, on the red side of the screen. Well, that's right. You know, the Fed funds uh, futures traders as well. Now they're pricing in an 80% uh, possibility that we can see 50 basis point rate hike, you know, in March 21st, 22nd. Odd. And just a couple of days ago, it was at around 22%. So that's clearly telling you the kind of hawkish sentiment that's returned back to the markets. In terms of our trade setup, well, the Indian markets, both the Nifty and the Nifty Bank, they're facing resistance at around the 50 day. Maybe we almost went to that mark and we did a U-turn uh, in Monday's trading session. But the point is, on Monday, well, the Indian markets came off the day's high. So maybe we're better prepared for this hawkish Fed statement that we saw. We'll get to that in just a bit. But volumes today could be relatively lower because parts of India continue uh, to celebrate Holi. And hopefully, maybe in fact, uh, the bears are going uh, for that Holi leave. So the bulls will feel a little bit good given that the volumes could be lower. And the institutions have been net buyers, both FIs as well as DIs. On Monday 1st, the Nifty came off close on 90 points on the day's stop. The Nifty Bank came off close on 320 points on the day's stop. And there was no fresh shorting that was seen. In fact, there was unwinding. Both on the Nifty Open Interest as well as the Nifty Bank, you had big unwinding of long positions that we saw. And that perfectly tallies in with what the FIs did. Well, they covered some short positions. So big short covering is what uh, we have seen. Close on 16,000 short contracts did cover out. And in the last three sessions, you know, you should pull up uh, this plate up there. Last three sessions, the short positioning, net short positioning has nearly halved on the FI side of things. So a bulk of that short covering bounce has played out. And now the short positions from around 85, 86% odd, it's come down to around 74%. Moving to the options data, two strikes I want to highlight. 17,800 call, well, that was getting written in Friday's, uh, uh, in Monday's trading session. And on the downside, 17,700 put. Now, there was a sense that there was some writing out there. So just pointing at that 17,700 put, you, the average uh, premium out there could be around 70 to around 80 rupees. So you deduct 70 rupees from around 17,700, you get your first stop loss. So the bulls will feel good if they can protect the 17,630 level on a closing basis, going by the writing we saw at around the 17,700 put. Uh, you know, if we break that, then maybe we open up uh, moving down to around the 200 DMA odd. On the upside, resistance at around the 50 DMA, as I said, both those levels come up for you on the screen. The SJX50 suggesting a pullback of around 130 points or thereabouts. The Nifty close, though, is closer to around the 17,775. So actually, we're bracing for around a 60, 70 point downtick. Mm -hmm. On a closing basis, you'll want to see 17,630 getting defended. But let's see whether or not that goes. Women's Day, maybe Lady Luck shines upon the bulls. Let's see whether or not, uh, you know, that works as well. Okay, well, on that note, let's tell you what's lined up in the first half hour of the show. We'll get you updates from the markets across the globe. Steve Bryce of Standard Chartered Wells will be joining in to discuss all that happened overnight, the steep fall that we saw in the global markets. We'll also have our research team bring you CNBC TV 18's list of top 10 stocks for the day at around 8.30 a.m. We'll do a fundamental stock analysis with Devin Choksi of KR Choksi. All right, uh, on the equities front, first up, we have a comment coming in from Jonathan Garner of Morgan Stanley, who says they continue to be overweight, China, Korea and Taiwan, and they're underweight, India and the ASEAN region. China's economic recovery and an improvement in the global semiconductor and technology cycle should drive earnings estimates steadily higher through 2023, and valuations are still attractive. The main risks, according to Morgan Stanley, are geopolitical in nature. 
Okay, let's get you some money market views as well. Kunal Sudhani of Shinhan Bank says, US Fed Chairman Jerome Powell has struck an uber hawkish tone in his testimony to the Congress, pushing the dollar index above yearly highs for the USD INR, he says. 81.80 acts as a support, while 82.36, which is last Friday's high, uh, is likely to be the first resistance. That is the level to watch, followed by 82.55. All right, and on the bonds, uh, Neeraj uh, of Axis Bank says that the 10-year benchmark bond yield traded in a range of 7.38 to 7.43% for the week, gradually drifting lower on the lack of auction supply and U.S. yields facing resistance at the highs. He says spreads between the government bonds and the SDLs widened on account of heavy SDL auction. For the rest of the week, he says the market would watch out for the U.S. non-farm payroll data, the U.S. CPI and the India CPI data. He expects a 10-year benchmark bond yield to trade between that 7.35 to 7.45 range, uh, the, as long as the data does not surprise on either side. Well, we have a lot of stock-specific action to track for you, and we'll get to that in just a bit in our special top 10 segment. But before the timing, let's run you through the list. Adani Ports, Adani Enterprises, Adani Transmission, and Adani Green. We also have IGL, Sun Pharma, All Cargo Logistics, Power Grid, Vardaman Special Steel, and Z Entertainment. Well, all of these stocks will be reacting to positive news flows, so hopefully most of them open up well in the green, and no stocks are likely, uh, you know, among these, are likely to open up in the red. So let's see how that goes. Okay, so those are the stocks that we'll watch out for. All the details coming up in just a bit. But it is the global setup that is the biggest headline this Wednesday morning. So let's take it up with the Steve Bryce, Chief Investment Officer at Standard Chartered Wealth Management. Steve, thanks very much for taking this call. Uh, so, you know, we were on a holiday here in Mumbai because of the Holi Festival. Woken up to rather, uh, you know, somber news from the U.S. Fed Chair this morning. You tell us, my first simple question is, has the market in its knee-jerk move overnight, has it already priced much of the disappointment, uh, I mean, if you're a bull, obviously it's a dis disappointment, or is this going to be uh, a start of repricing that will continue with the, maybe the 10-year moving higher, equities moving lower? How are you reading through this? So I think, you know, I think the market's still digesting what Powell went through um, uh, in his testimony yesterday. So I think, you know, there, there is still the near-term bias potentially for uh, for. You know, a ten-year yield, for instance, to move higher. Particularly, the two-year yield, um, you know, looks looks um, you know to to move higher as well. Um, however, from a bigger picture perspective, we just think this uh, doubles down on our view that ultimately the Fed will over tighten. Actually, my, my personal feeling is that the Fed has already over tightened, uh, and if we were to stay here for long enough, that would induce a recession. So, obviously, if they are doubling down on further rate hikes potentially shifting to a, a back to 50 basis points moves, then that would just mean that the that the over tightening will become even greater uh, and that will lead to a recession. So, you know, so we, we still expect the curve to remain very significantly inverted, um, but the two year yield does seem to you know be, be, be moving higher and, and, and likely to move higher in the short term. So if you think the Fed has over tightened already, what is your prognosis of what the March end Fed meeting could result in? I mean, there are talks that there could be a 50 basis points rate hike as well. Um, is, that, uh, is that something that you're not expecting? And what do you see as the move on global equity markets now? Look, I, I guess on your first question, I, I think the, the the Fed's in a really difficult situation. Let's not make it easier than it is, right? I mean, the uh, if you've got very strong growth data out there at the moment, inflation is looking p particularly sticky, um, then it is it is very difficult for it to sort of look through the cycle and say, you know, probabilistically we've we've over tightened. Then number one concern at this stage is in, uh, to bring inflation lower. And any weakness it, uh, it um, um, generates on that side or signals on that side, um, then that could make its job a lot harder uh, further down the road. So, you know, I think, you know, 50 basis points, depending on obviously the inflation report and the unemployment report due before the Fed FOMC meeting is, 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 is a definite possibility. What does this mean for equity markets? Well, obviously, you know, we've seen the knee-jerk uh, lower overnight. I mean, uh, you know, from our perspective, you know, higher rates is, is, is obviously something that markets struggle with, uh, uh, particularly in the U.S. market because it's a heavy weight towards tech. Um, so that is, a, that is an environment that is, is, is pretty challenging. Um, but our biggest concern is saying, you know, uh, it, it is for, for another third leg lower for, uh, for U.S. equities actually comes from that recession risk. So if we do see a recession uh, before the end of this year, then we are likely pricing in too strong earnings, or stronger earnings than we're likely to see. 
um, going forward, and we could see that third leg coming coming lower to the U.S. stock market, uh, potentially testing lows of last year and maybe even making new lows. So that's that's the bigger risk we feel for for the U.S. market rather than the rates outlook in the short term. All right. Uh, hi, Steve. Morning. You know, in a month or so, how things change, right? I remember when we were chatting <laughs> the last time, maybe you were hinting even at some rate cuts towards the end of the year. You believe post this commentary that we're getting, that's out of the window? I, I don't think it is. I mean, it's obviously harder to, to make that call today than it was a month mm. ago. Um, but I, I don't think it is, because once the, the recession becomes clear, then the Fed is going mm. to be faced with a situation of saying, OK, yes, inflation is above my target. But how yeah. much higher am I willing to push the unemployment rate? How I mean, We know that monetary policy acts with a very significant lag. Um, so, you know, if, if we did were in recession by the end of this year, there'd still be further mm. tightening down the pipes um, coming okay. from, from financial conditions, generally speaking. Uh, and from that perspective, then the Fed, uh, do right. they really sort of hold stance and leave uh, interest rates where they are um, right. uh, as the economy starts to, to, to go into a recession? Um, yes. It's going to be a difficult situation when we get there because inflation won't be at 2% or lower. It mm. will be probably, you know, uh, 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 at least above 3%, maybe even above 4% yeah. by the time that happens. So they will probably ease reluctantly, um, but uh, I think mm. we still will see easing by before the end of the year. Okay. All right. So there's still an outside chance that we get some rate, high, rate cuts towards the end of the year. So that's pretty good uh, news. But, uh, Steve, let's talk about our Indian markets. You know, you were tilting towards China. One of the factors that mm. was plaguing Indian markets a month or so ago was the Adani group. They were in a bit of a tizzy, but now there is some clarity emerging out there. They've managed to raise some money, releasing pledge, some confidence is back into the system. Will you still drift towards China in comparison to India? Or do you believe post this recent underperformance of India, we're fairly well placed now? So, I mean, we were never bearish on India, right? So let's put it in context. So we're overweight Asia, ex Japan, uh, at the sort of level two, regional level of equities. And within that, we're neutral India. So we'd expect, for instance, India to outperform uh, the US stock market over the course of the, the, the rest of the year. We still have a tilt towards China. Obviously, China's going through a, a repricing in, in very recent past as well. Um, in terms of, you know, there's a, some concerns on the geopolitical side obviously playing out and, uh, mm. you know, not everything's been uh, swimmingly positive. Um, but ultimately, we think that the, the, the price differential or valuation differential obviously is very much in favour of China stocks. And we see that impetus in growth uh, coming through as well as uh, China obviously targeting over 5%. We'll think they'll beat that quite convincingly uh, this year. So from that perspective, we still feel that China uh, is likely to outperform. But that doesn't mean that uh, India can't do very well this year and probably outperform what, even what it did last year when we were overweight uh, in, a, in obviously a falling, a falling environment. You know, Steve, I just want to uh, kind of uh, probe a little deeper on, on that analysis. Of course, it sounds fantastic to us sitting here that you are expecting India, despite whatever is happening with the Fed, to actually outperform at least the U.S. market. Now, in, in history, it's kind of been a little different, right? Every time the mother market goes into any sort of a, a slump, whether it was the global financial crisis or, you know, several other crises before that, uh, emerging markets also end up underperforming. So what makes you confident that this time it's going to be different and India can actually outperform the U.S. market irrespective of this recession and the, the impact it's having there? Yeah, I think, I think it comes down to that the dollar is obviously an important uh, piece here. I mean, the way I sort of look at this, I mean, I'm more probably from a China perspective than an India perspective, but, you know, I see this as a mini 2008-2009 cycle, whereas where the U.S. heads into recession, but China is on the, a different path. Obviously, then it massively stimulates, some would argue, overstimulates the economy uh, and creates some of the debt challenges we're still faced with today. But I think you know, we do see... We don't see the U.S. recession being anything like as severe as the global financial crisis, um, um, but we don't also see China stimulating to the same extent, but obviously on a, a different path. From an India perspective, I think the key thing is that dollar. So if we see the dollar uh, peaking out probably on that growth differential uh, or different pro uh, projectiles uh, for Asian growth versus U.S. growth, um, we think that should be quite positive from a um, from a uh, Indian market perspective. And obviously, if we do see the U.S. go into recession, then that should cap any increase in oil prices as well, which should be positive for the Indian economy and also the stock market. All right, uh, Steve, we will we'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in and speaking to CNBC TV 18. So that's the word coming in on the global market. Steve Bryce Singh, 
that they expect the Indian markets to outperform the U.S. for the rest of the year. Uh, he doesn't rule out the possibility of the U.S. markets getting back to their lows that they saw last year. Uh, sometime through the course of 2023. All right, let's slip into a quick break. On the other side, we'll get you our list of top 10 stocks as we kickstart a brand new day of trade. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. Well, the adjusted uh, SGX Nifty is down about 40 to 50 points, so the start is going to be in the red. But there are plenty of stocks to focus on this morning. Our entire research team is joining us bright and early to help us prep for the day. First up, lots happening on the Adani group, so let's get that in focus. Uh, Vivek is here with more on that. Vivek, morning. Well, good morning. You know, quite a few developments as far as the Adani Group is concerned. An important development, actually, and it's quite positive as far as the entire group is there. Uh, Adani Group has actually gone ahead and prepaid almost 7,370 crore worth of uh, share back financing. And, you know, this is ahead of the planned maturity of April 2025. Now, the payment has been made to various international banks and Indian financial institutions where the shares were actually pledged. Now, looking at the breakup of this prepayment, Adani Ports, you know, because of the prepayment, the pledged shares will actually get released. So, 11.8% of the promoters holding shall be released in Adani Ports. Uh, in Adani Enterprises, 4% will be released. Adani Transmission, 4.5%. And Adani Green, 1.2% of the promoters holding will actually be released. Now, that actually takes the total amount of uh, you know, share pledge repayment to over $2,016 million. And this has been done in the months of February as well as March of 2023. Now, what the company is saying is that this is actually in line with the promoter's commitment to prepay all of the share back financing before 31st of March 2023. So that will be an important development to track as far as the entire group is concerned. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot for that, Vivek. Uh, let's hop across to Sonal, who's joining in to tell us about IJL. They're looking at a JV Sonal to oh, set yes. up a smart meters manufacturing plant. Tell oh, us more. Yeah. Oh, yes, an interesting one at that because that is exactly not what the company does. So it's a new foray as well for IGL. IGL and Genesis Gas Solutions have entered into a joint venture. This is to set up integrated smart meter manufacturing plant. Uh, this will, in, uh, will have a capex of around 110 crore rupees and plant will have an install capacity of 1 million meters annually as well. They expect the plant will be operation, operational by 2024. Uh, the participation ratio, IGL will hold around 51% in this JV. 49% will be uh, driven by Genesis. Uh, now, this is an interesting field where a lot of capex is happening across uh, the industry as well. So, we'll see which way things go. But for now, it's an interesting diversification that IGL has undertaken. Gas companies are always coming out with something new or the other these days. It was NGL hitting the headlines on Monday and now it's IGL. Thanks, Sonal, for that. Uh, let's get to Mangla. Mangla, you're watching for some more stocks? I have a bunch of them on my radar today. Quite a handful, actually. Sun Pharma, we start with that. Uh, they've gone ahead and, you know, completed the acquisition of Concert Pharma. Remember, they had acquired uh, or made the, the announcement of this acquisition on Jan 28th itself. It's a $567 million acquisition plus additional payments of $252 million. All Cargo is the other one that I'm watching out for. They've bought their partner's stake, 39% uh, stake in contract logistics at an enterprise value of 373 odd crores. This business, remember, does an EBITDA of almost th uh, 31 crores in the third quarter itself. Apart from that, they've also decided to sell their non-core customs clearance business for an EV of, uh, uh, you know, 60, uh, 42 crores. That's 61.1% stake that they've sold. Power Grid is the other one, a near 4,100 crore capex, which has been announced by the company, approved by the board. So we're expecting, uh, you know, 524 crores worth uh, uh, eastern region expansion to be commissioned in November 2025. The transmission system for Kurnul Wind Energy Zone, which is in Andhra Pradesh, which is worth nearly 3,500 crores, also expected to commission by November. 2024. Vardhaman Special Steels is the other one that I'm watching out for. Their uh, investor, Aichi, which uh, invested some stake in the company, has gone ahead and, you know, asked uh, uh, for mass production of steel for forging companies. Uh, uh, this, uh, they've, they've uh, you know, also started to supply to Toyota, and this would amount to nearly 10,000 metric tons in terms of capex, uh, uh, in terms of approximately, uh, approximate volumes in the next financial year. And finally, we have Z, where one more hurdle has been cleared. It's entered into a settlement with IPRS, which is one of its creditors, had earlier filed against the company's, uh, company for insolvency. And uh, they've uh, decided to end all disputes and claims between them. Apart from that, remember, uh, the city deal is also today. So we will watch out for all these things as the company is removing all the hurdles towards uh, the merger. 
All right, thanks a lot, Mangalam, for that. So, a lot of uh, corporate developments, and as Mangalam was saying, All Cargo Logistics is in focus. They've bought the remaining stake from their partner in Contract Logistics. So, we'll be speaking about that in just a bit with the management. So, that chat comes up at 8:35 a.m. But here's a quick recap of all the stocks that we're looking at this morning. Stocks with positive news flow: There's Adani Ports, Adani Enterprises. Adani Transmission, so the uh, entire Adani group in focus. There's IGL, Sun Pharma, All Cargo Logistics, Power Grid, Vardaman, Special Steels, and Z Entertainment. While no stocks on the radar with negative news flow, so we'll uh, of course focus on that. Uh, but largely, a lot of positive news flow coming through this morning. All right. Well, let's turn our attention then away from the equity markets and focus on the commodity space. Manisha Gupta joins us to tell us exactly that. Morning, Manisha. Morning, Nigel. Thank you for that. Well, we have seen most of the commodities start the day with a decline as the dollar index has seen a strong gain. And, you know, it was just about yesterday that the markets were pricing a 30% chance of a 50 basis rate hike for the month of March. Now, that has increased to 70% of a possibility, and that's weighing on to the markets. The weak China data also does not support. So you have the crude oil prices that fell 3.5% overnight. Silver now is trading at a four-month lows. Gold prices posted a worse day in a month. And the base metal prices have declined as well. So we've seen copper decline by 2.5%. Yesterday is trading quite flat right now. Same goes for aluminum and zinc as well, where we have seen prices decline between 1% to 2% already in this week. So yet another weak start in Asia and in China especially. Okay, we'll watch out for how this plays out. Manisha, thanks very much for telling us how... Uh, those comments are uh, uh, sort of uh, working through the commodities market. We'll take a break on that note. On the other side, we get our conversation going with Devin Choksi of KR Choksi. We'll talk about some uh, fundamental ideas, a couple of individual stocks. After that, we'll connect with uh, Ravi uh, Jhakar of All Cargo Logistics. We'll talk about the company's purchase of you near know, 39% uh, equity in contract logistics. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back. As promised, we have a lot of corporates in focus. All Cargo Logistics is the stock on our radar. The company has bought uh, its partner stake, a 38.87% stake in contract logistics at an enterprise value of uh, 373 uh, crores. To discuss more on this development, Ra Ravi Jhakar, who is the Chief Strategy Officer at All Cargo Logistics, joins us now to talk about that. Mr. Jhakar, good morning uh, and lots to talk about, a lot of developments in the company. So let me start one by one. Uh, you bought the 38.8% uh, stake in contract logistics for about 373 crores. So can you tell us a little bit about what is the uh, you know, expectation in terms of growth for contract logistics? How much has the company grown since your acquisition in 2016? And what is the expected EBITDA per quarter? That is the kind of run rate that you're looking at for this business? Yeah, uh, so it's a pleasure to be on your show. Uh, let me start with more near-term outlook on the business. The business uh, has grown many folds since our acquisition in 2016. Uh, we did about 27, 28 floor uh, EBITDA towards the start of this financial year in quarter one. Last quarter, we did about 31, and we believe that this increasing trend uh, should stay over the coming quarter. So that's the trend I would speak about because as new contracts start getting signed and we manage more and more inventory for our clients, you would see revenue and EBITDA grow pretty much in line with our last two, three quarters of growth rate. Uh, in terms of uh, the business, uh, this is a very, very strategically important uh, business for us. And like you rightly said, we have been doing a lot of corporate restructuring to align with our overall goal of uh, having a clean structure, building strategically independent businesses, focusing on core businesses, and exiting from non-core. And this mm -hmm. particular transaction takes care of both these aspects. We are able to focus more on our contract logistics business with this 100% uh, stake belonging to us now. And at the same mm -hmm. time, through the same transaction, we also divested the smaller custom clearance business that we did not see a score to our business. So this uh, this 31 crore EBITDA that you spoke about, uh, can you tell us if you're seeing this trend increase, what could the growth be by the end of the year? What would the EBITDA per quarter look like? And what are you? what's the prognosis for FY24 as well? So like I said, over the last two quarters, it has grown from about 27, 28 to about 31. Expect a similar growth rate to continue over the next two to four quarters. Okay, all right. So they are talking about more than a 15% growth. 
uh, you know, at 31 crores odd, if I try to extrapolate it on an annual basis, it should be in that vicinity of around 130 crores for FY24. Yeah, that's the uh, opportunity the business offers, and we are. Uh, we are uh, am I am I underestimating it? Yeah. Would you want to give a bigger number for this business, the EBITDA number on an annual basis? We prefer to refrain from exact guidance, but I would say oh. that we have seen this growth uh, at a healthy rate, and that should continue. So we should see 15-20% okay. kind of growth uh, in this business. Oh. Because at present, you're doing around 30 crores. So that's around 120 crores. A growth of around 15%, you know, would entail that you do around 140 crores. So we can leave it at that in terms of this business. A bitta roughly on an annual basis could be around 140 crores. Let's move on. Will you be putting any more, money in, uh, any more money into this uh, business that you're acquiring? And also, you spoke about non-core uh, assets. Now, now you're selling, uh, you know, closer around, uh, uh, you're selling some part of that, 61% stake, I think so. Uh, is what you're selling in one of those businesses. Uh, what do you do with the other 39% and any more non-core assets you're looking to sell? Yeah, so the 39% already belongs to the JV partner. So we are selling our 61%. That marks our full exit from the uh, custom clearance business. Uh, speaking of other non-core assets, we have already cleaned up uh, most of the businesses across the group. There are two businesses which still are somewhat non-core. One is the fuel stations, which are in Gati which we have been in the process of divesting, but uh, there have been some uh, regulatory approvals, et cetera, required for the fuel stations, which may take some more time. But it's a small business uh, in terms of its contribution to bottom line as well. The second non-core business is the uh, equipment business, which we have also been reducing our capital employed in that business. So these are the two businesses, but apart from that, everything is already done. And uh, what this transaction does, you know, the, high, uh, the, the core strategic aspect of this is that we have already demerged the two businesses, the real estate and the terminals business. What now remains behind in all cargo is the international supply chain and the domestic supply chain. On the domestic supply chain, we had two partners. We had KWE in the express logistics business, and we had CCI uh, group in the contract logistics. We announced earlier about acquiring the KWE stake, and now with the acquisition of the entire stake from CCI, effectively, this creates the platform for the contract logistics and express logistics business uh, to be uh, fully uh, managed and controlled by us and allows us to plan for uh, the strategic, uh, you know, collaboration and synergies. And as you're aware, mm. uh, about five mm. months ago, we had also taken the approval from the board for restructuring and aligning these businesses. So in the near future, you would hear more about how do we bring these businesses so uh, closer and make them more efficient. So Ravi, uh, just to get a number to sort of put it all together, uh, your target for FI26, you know, 25 to 30,000 crores in revenue, 24 to 2,700 crores in uh, EBITDA. As you undertake all this restructuring to get to that FI26 target, just in terms of, uh, you know, money, how much is all the divestment of non-core assets, you know, as a sum? Can you leave us with a range? How much uh, would that perhaps throw up in terms of, uh, you know, cash to use? And if you're looking at any further strategic investments, um, into, you know, the company like the one that uh, you've now acquired 100% of, how much cash do you see yourself deploying or investing uh, in any other uh, inorganic moves which you think are strategic to your business? Yeah, so on the non-core asset disposal, very small amounts remain. Mm. So put together, we're looking at, you know, a small number in the range of 100, 150 crores, not much beyond on that. On the acquisitions, we are very well placed in the domestic supply chain business. What we may entail is uh, continue to evaluate strategic opportunities in the international supply chain business wherein we look for uh, and these are not large uh, ticket transactions these will be smaller transactions specific to a particular geography specific to a particular strategic cause that we want to pursue and do you already have capital, something on the radar uh, ravi since you you're very clear on the uh, inorganic route no, do you no. have something on the on the radar no, there's nothing on the radar, but you know, if you look at our last 19 acquisitions that we've done, and each one has been successful, the reason mm -hmm. is that we are very strategic and proactive. We're not looking at transactions to be brought to us. We're always on the lookouts for identifying what we need to do, whether we need to extend our presence across a particular geography, we want to launch a new product, or we want to achieve another strategic objective like mm -hmm. getting into a business segment. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'm saying that we have clarity in terms of you know our goals, mm -hmm. geographic expansion, and that clarity would lead to uh, certain uh, acquisitions uh, that would follow. Sure. But those would be smaller strategy acquisitions, like I said, yeah. All right, uh, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, there's lots happening in terms of streamlining of the business. 
and we look forward to hear from you again. That's all Cargo Logistics. Uh, they have an FY26 target. They've uh, acquired remainder stake in contract logistics as well. And they say that the increasing trend of the EBITDA per quarter is something that could continue as far as contract logistics is concerned. But let's get back to the markets now and talk about some more stocks. Uh, Devin Choksi is sitting by with us. Patiently, Devin, I wanted your thoughts on Bajaj Auto because there are two very interesting notes that uh, you know brokerages have come out with. So let me just put one of them on board. JP Morgan has written a note on Bajaj Auto uh, where they speak about how the stock could re-rate this year. They have a target of 4400 which is a big upside to the current market price. They have an overweight call as well. Now, they say that the company is getting very aggressive in uh, electric vehicles. They are ramping up both their two- and three-wheeler segment. They are scaling up their Chetak EV volumes to 10,000 monthly run rate versus current three to 4,000 units. They are also looking to launch uh, an EV <coughs> three-wheeler uh, that's been coming a while, but now we understand that in April of this year, the launch could take place. Uh, so they're scaling up their EV business, not just that. Uh, exports are perhaps likely to bottom out. Uh, that's what the management was indicating as well. Uh, JP Morgan is expecting a recovery from Q2 uh, of FY24. They're expecting a recovery in the domestic two-wheeler volumes as well. The most important thing is that the risk reward is attractive from a valuation perspective. The stock is trading at about 13 and a half times FY25, which is below its historic average. So, Devin, what are your thoughts? Uh, do you also believe that the risk reward is favorable in stocks like Bajaj Auto? Yeah, good morning, Sonia. Certainly, I think when you want to uh, buy into some of the good quality businesses, the best time to buy them would be the time when I think the situation is uncertain as far as I think the market is concerned. Currently, the market is uh, discounting the stock, as rightly mentioned by you, at around 13, 14 times. And that's something which is becoming an attractive proposition with a strong balance sheet uh, that the company has and uh, extremely strong and convincing product launches that they are making in, in, in these times. is suggesting that going forward, when the situation is basically becoming normal for them, they would probably start getting higher amount of revenue and the profits. The current problem is also due to the export-related uh, issues, I think, which has come up due to, I think, variety of problems happening in the global environment. And I think these issues could possibly take around two, three months to get settled down, in my viewpoint. Uh, should that happen, then probably, I think, export-related issues are also, I think, uh, going out of the way. And that should be the time when the company should be for relatively better numbers. But we remain relatively more confident and positive about the possibilities of the new launches that the company is making. And in such situation, we'll have relatively better amount of business to talk about. So yes, I think at current levels, it becomes a buy opportunity. Any fall is definitely a buy opportunity. Okay. Uh, Devin, hi. Morning. That's, uh, that's a word on Bajaj Auto. Uh, wanted to get your thoughts on some of these city gas distribution companies. Very interesting news flow around them, right? Mahanagar Gas has done this acquisition. They want to get a little more aggressive and grow in newer areas. Today we have news on IGL. They are getting into smart meters, partnering with another company. Your thoughts and when, whether any of these stocks uh, make the cut for you in terms of uh, putting some fresh money to work? Yes, it'll be good morning. Uh, on one side, the prices of uh, the gas, which basically I think the city gas distributor uh, has a raw material cost. If this particular price remains stable, which current environment is suggesting so, if that remains stable, then probably I think the uh, forward plans uh, are absolutely in place for most of the CGD companies. They have the new circles. They have got higher amount of uh, uh, volume to talk about from both domestic as well as industrial users. And at the same time, I think the uh, sustained growth is happening for this business. So from a perspective of buying into them, I think this could be a better time. Also because of the fact that the valuations have corrected. Should it correct because of the market sentiment? Uh, should it correct further rather, I think, because of the market sentiment? Then in such situation, I think they would become really an interesting proposition to buy. Such kind of utility businesses definitely, I think, provide you higher amount of visibility from the point of view of earnings over a period of time, except the point which I made about the raw material prices. If that remains stable, then possibility of, I think, you getting the better valuation at this point of time remains very high. So a buy at fall, I think that would be the view that I would put across. Mm. Hi, Devin. Uh, good morning and happy holy year. You know, Devin, I'm uh, wondering whether GQG is in a tight spot, right? They must be wondering what to do. They bought the stock of Adani and suddenly they're making returns of 40, 50 percent. Uh, but be there as it may, what's the outlook on some of these Adani group stocks? They've seen a big rally. Some of those cement assets, though, ACC and Ambucha, both of them have come off the recent uh, peak that we saw even on Monday's trading session.
how would you approach both these two names in particular, ACC and Ambuja Cements? Yeah, Nigel, happy early to you as well and good morning. Uh, definitely, I think the ACC Ambuja in particular remains, I think, strong proposition. Earlier, uh, the market mm. was apprehensive about uh, Adani Group's ability to fund this acquisition. I guess I think with the kind of money that they have started receiving and the strong cash flow which is across the group that they are having from different, different uh, business operations, I would like to believe that I think ACC and Mujati core could possibly be completed in a due course of time which they have projected or they have uh, put across on paper. From that perspective, I guess I, I, guess I think the stock price pressure should uh, not be seen hereafter. From the business perspective, I think these both businesses remain, both companies rather, I think, remain absolutely strong in convincing from the cement uh, business that they have. On one side, I think, strong mining proposition, on the other side, uh, strong distribution proposition because of their rail network connected with port. I would believe that uh, I, this company would, or these companies would rather, uh, would have relatively better time going forward. So corrective downside in the market definitely remains, I think, an opportunity. The stock prices have recovered to a, uh, to a certain extent from the lows. But I would think that I think any correction in the price would remain a buy side opportunity. Overall infrastructure portfolio of Adani Group remains pretty convincing. They are only mature portfolios. They are generating cash. They are then uh, suggesting the, uh, the, the, the predictability of cash generation over the next few years because of uh, the hard assets on the ground. So from that perspective, I think I remain very convinced and probably I think correction in the price in the stock can offer a good or long-term opportunity to the investment I think one who is doing about five years and 10 years for now. Okay, okay. All right, uh, Devin, thanks a lot for that. Uh, let's do one thing. Let's take a quick commercial break. On the other side of the break, we'll tell you how to approach the markets. Looks like a gap down opening is coming, but Mitesh Thakkar and Sudarshan Sukhani will tell us how to brace ourselves for it. Some technical tips and trading ideas coming up in a bit. Welcome back. You're with us on uh, Bazaar, and we have Anuj joining in to talk about today's setup. Anuj, morning. You know, just when I think everybody was uh, kind of pushing themselves out mm. of the holy festivities, mm. Mr. Jerome Powell decides to give the, this big shocker, saying, "You know, get out of that hangover quickly, right?" <laughs> yeah. Huh? Morning, uh, Surabeep, uh, Sonia, morning. and Nigel. Uh, and uh, for starters, uh, to uh, Surabhi, to you and Sonia, happy Women's Day. Uh, Nigel, to you as well, of course, uh, to, for all of us, uh, and to to our team, of course, uh, a team run. Uh, you know, uh, I think 70% women uh, in our team. So, uh, to all of you, uh, uh, happy Women's Day. But, well, uh, coming to market, uh, it's very interestingly poised because we have recovered almost 55% of the entire fall. And, uh, you know, 50 to 60, 65% is what you normally do if it's a counter trend move. So, I think in that sense, today is a bit of a test of the market, especially with the kind of hawkish statement from Jeremy Powell, which is not something which is new, but even then, uh, because the market reacted, of course, we'll see how, how things move. I think today's big sort of uh, market event to track would be the divergence once again between IT and banks. That's been playing out for the last few days. Uh, Nasdaq once again had a bad close yesterday and Nifty IT had a very strong rally on Monday. So I think today's trade would be about whether the first hour decline in IT stocks, that gets arrested or not. If that gets bought, I think the markets rally. If uh, you break the first hour low, the markets decline. That's my basic sense. Uh, on the Nifty, as uh, again, uh, see the first hour and then react accordingly because we have still not negated the 20-day moving average halt. I think the Bank Nifty is strong. And on Monday, Bank Nifty consolidated ahead of the weekly expiry. And my sense is today could be a perfect day to see a bit of a buy on dips play out on the Bank Nifty, especially given the kind of strength that we have now in some of the big banking names like ICICI Bank and State Bank of India. All right, uh, Anuj, thanks a lot for that. Have a good day. Uh, Sudarshan Sukhani of Technical Trends and Mitesh Thakkar is also joining in to give us their views on the market. Gentlemen, morning to both of you. Happy Holi, Sudarshan. Uh, doesn't, it's not going to be a great Holi for uh, the bulls today. And uh, I like that, you know, you have all that Holi color on you. So you're celebrating, I guess, in a big way. How are you feeling about the market now? Do you think it's going to be uh, the dips that we see uh, are going to get bought? Or do you get back to being cautious? What's the prognosis? Yeah, good morning. Actually, North India is celebrating Holi today. And yes. uh, this is, I'm assuming this is just the starting. So everyone, a uh, lot of good wishes. See, the markets uh, go up and then most of us say, oh, if there was a dip, we would be buyers. 
and today we are getting a dip. I'm quite sure we won't have the courage to buy, but we should. The Nifty is a buying opportunity thanks to that news event or whatever else is happening. And this is a dip. And we say buy on a dip, we are getting it today. So keep a stop of 100 points from your entry price and don't worry about the gap down. These things happen. The Nifty trend is still up, the in short term trend. And I would be a buyer here. But Sonia, this is not the same for the Bank Nifty because, you know, the Bank Nifty rallied seven days prior to the Nifty's rally. So the Bank Nifty has done its bit. I would completely avoid the Bank Nifty and be a willing buyer thanks to that dip in the Nifty. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for that, uh, uh, Sudarshan. You're sounding quite optimistic on the index. Mitesh, morning. A happy Holi. What about you? How are you feeling on the index? SGX, if you're suggesting a gap down, maybe a 70, 80 point down take if you adjust it. Would you be looking to buy in or would you avoid it? Morning, Ali. Uh, wish you and viewers and the entire CMC team a very happy early. Uh, coming to the index, uh, my sense is that uh, 17,600 uh, is a very uh, good support level to look at in the short term. Uh, we might open around uh, 17,625, 635 zone and therefore I think that could be a good entry point. And uh, the 70, 80 point gap down, if it happens uh, in the opening trade, buy with a stop below 17,575. Uh, the idea is that uh, the overall short term direction, which is the hourly and the two hourly charts, are positively biased and therefore gap down should be a good opportunity, keeping the stop roughly about 20, 25 points lower than your uh, initial support because the morning trade could see some uh, mild volatility before the hourly closing at 10 o'clock comes into play. So for the timing, I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a 50, 60 point stop loss from the opening levels, assuming it's around 76, 30 and take a long position. And on the bank nifty, I think, you know, uh, I would look at 40,900 holding out. If that happens, then I think we'll go long there as well, because the PSU banking lot, look, it does look appealing to me. Okay, gentlemen, let's get to the picks as well. So that should let me come to you first. So what are the stocks you'd work with today? Yeah, oh, first, Nigel, I'm sounding optimistic because of the charts, not because of any holy inputs, okay? Absolutely, Sudarshan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's too early absolutely, in the I mean, we get that, right? <laughs> Go ahead with your picks. <laughs> yeah, L&D is a buying opportunity. See, good quality stocks should be bought on dips. We are getting a dip. This is a positional buy because for the day, it's very difficult to predict how the markets will behave, how much randomness will come in, what will be the choppy nature of the market. So you look at good quality stocks and go and buy them on these dips. It's a buy. Keep a wide stop of 50 points and go for it. Hindalco is an intraday short. Hindalco has not participated in any rally. You know, it keeps on coming down. So it's an intraday short with a stop above 422. Godrej Consumer Products is giving signs of distribution. That's not good. It's an intraday short again with a stop above 926. You know, these stops need to be adjusted because the gap down will create different values. But primarily the theme is that both these stocks are intraday shorts and finally Reliance is a buy. Same thing as I said for Nifty. You're, you're getting this dip. Go and buy it. Keep a stop at 2300 and become a positional trader in Reliance. Okay, very interesting calls. Uh, we'll watch out uh, for how these stocks do. Thanks, Sudarshan, for that. Mitesh, your picks? So I have uh, more buys uh, today uh, as the recommendation side and uh, Coromandel Fertilizers is a buy if it starts getting past uh, highs of uh, Monday. So buy, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, if you get it on a buy dip, so buy around 9.25, keep a stop at 9.10, uh, look for targets of 9.55. GNFC is a conditional buy if it starts getting past Monday's high, that's a buy with a stop at 5.60, uh, buy above 5.62 with a stop at 5.50 for targets of 5.90. And also buy on Coal India, which I would want to buy around 222, 223, with a stop at 218 for a target of 232. The solitary sell call is JSW Steel, with a stop at 685. Look for targets of uh, around or maybe just below 650 levels. Uh, well, gentlemen, thanks a lot for all of these stock ideas. We'll come to you again in a bit. We need to take a short commercial break. We'll have the pre-opening rates when we get back. We're just about three, four minutes away from that. And we also have Harshvardhan Dole of IIFL to discuss the power sector as the country expects to see a peak in demand this summer. Stay tuned for more on that.